Hey everyone, welcome to another AI conversation. And today I'm joined by a rather unique guest, in my opinion, uh, Mario Pelisciano. He's got a very rich history. I won't, I won't, I won't ruin the suspense. I'll let him tell you himself. I actually met Mario recently when he was uh, in Manila, right before, uh, right before New Year's or right before Christmas. But he's actually based in Switzerland, so that's the most I will say. I'll leave the rest to him. Welcome to the conversation, Mario. Uh, thank you, Doc, and uh, appreciate uh, you having me here. Yeah. So, compared to some some of the other people I've actually talked uh, talked to, you might be somewhat of a mystery, except to, for a few people. So maybe for the general public who doesn't know enough, uh, and I can I, I can't oversell it uh, too much. Maybe share a brief background on yourself and what you're doing now. Sure. So. My name is uh, actually Mario Mokhtarian Feliciano. I'm uh, half Iranian, half Filipino. So my mother is from Iran. My father is from the Philippines. I, I was born and raised in the Middle East. And um, for those of you who haven't grown in the grown up in the Middle East, uh, it's it's a different culture, different uh, set of uh, principles and you know attitudes towards, let's say, our Kababayans. I grew up in that in the 80s and 90s and uh I let's just say I didn't like the way our our fellow Filipinos were were being treated in the Middle East so I grew up as uh, as someone who wants to change the Philippines make it better right and uh my dad said I asked my dad how my dad said you can do two things be a politician or be a military officer so I I chose to be a military officer after high school. I, I went back, volunteered for the AFP. After a year in the PMA, I, I had the opportunity to also then study in the USMA and mm -hmm. served in the Philippine Army, a total of about 10 years. Um, I After that, I got married, um, moved with my wife to Europe. And that was a very, it was a tough time because let's just say not everyone wants to hire an infantry officer. Yeah. And that's where my journey in IT began. I did some IT work and a lot of GIS and innovative work for the Philippine Army when I was in, uh, using open source information to help with resource allocations and all that. But it, coming to Switzerland, uh, the, I had to learn business intelligence from scratch. And I guess that's where the pres perseverance uh, from the military comes in, because in one week, uh, I learned business intelligence, applied for a few trainee roles. And I guess that's the, I guess if it's something I would like to share maybe with your audience is that, uh, and I had this conversation with a friend a couple of years ago, I was a first lieutenant, senior first lieutenant captain promotable. And, you know, leaving the military and then starting from scratch was tough. Uh, and, you know, being from where you were managing, you know, many men and people, resources and money and being a trainee where your colleagues are all just fresh graduates, it's a big pill to swallow. But it's the things you have to do, right? In order, you take one step back, but in the long run, it's two, three steps forward. So I did that, did started as a business intelligence trainee. And naturally, um, because of my ability to you know, informally lead and manage my teammates and encouraging them, hey, let's do this, let's move forward. Um, I got to be a project manager. Then uh, from there, I decided to take my MBA. I did a dual MBA and had the chance to then be an IT director in a pharmaceutical company. And uh, as part of that pharmaceutical company, I got a chance to also do my scholarship in data science. And uh, I did that uh, while working full-time with four kids. I graduated early last year. So right now I'm a blockchain product director, um, helping integrate uh, different pharmaceutical companies uh, with blockchain solutions. And one of them is the electronic product information. And uh, that's something I've been working on recently. A lot of to say, but I tried to summarize it as short as I could, Doc. No, I mean, as far as bios go, that's probably off the beaten track, no? From uh, uh, military to BI to data science, and then now to pharma and then blockchain. <laughs> that's, a, that's an amazing... 
I mean, uh, well, anyway, kudos to you, you know, for making the. Be, you know, I've I've had uh, the privilege of talking to a number of career shifters. I mean, career shifting is really kind of the, it's the quintessential, uh, you know, situation for many, for many people mm. because, especially now that we're in a transition period, I mean, everyone loves talking about you know AI. I I see it as third to fourth industrial revolution. So I think mm -hmm. shifting is implicit. You know, the rules are changing, the environment is changing, technologies are changing, and soon so societal uh, and legal and, you know, changes are are, are, are imminent. And, you, and your career is an example of that, you know. Uh, you were probably born, uh, like many of us, in the third industrial revolution, but you're now finding yourself in the fourth. Uh, I mean, blockchain is a fourth industrial revolution technology. True. Okay. Um, I don't know, I don't know if you mind if we dwell on that kind of that story for a moment uh because i know you sure. have a project that you want to talk about too just that the i, I want to center on that period when you had to start from scratch uh mm. so to speak and get into bi um which is in in, in a way the the gateway drug to analytics the gateway drug to data, data science why bi of all things you know were there any other jobs I guess the the reason uh, why I went with business intelligence, uh, there were a few, but I guess it was the fact that it matched my educational background as an engineering manager uh, mm -hmm. coming from West Point. And, you know, in, in these kinds of two, you use data to help make decisions. And uh, one of the key things is the idea of multi-criteria decision-making process, right? Yeah. Uh, it's something you can use in procurement or in military decision-making process or even in business decisions. So the idea of using data to make decisions was a natural choice why I applied for that business intelligence trainee role. And, you know, the thing back then, uh, it was about, I think, 11, 12 years ago, ClickView was one of them, right? Yeah. Um, and the beauty of this is, you know, if there's a will, there is a way. If there's a tool out there that is relatively new, information is rampant and mm -hmm. it's more now than 11 years ago especially with the the massive online open you know college mocs they call them coursera udemy edx yeah yeah back then it was just youtube hmm. and uh, yeah. now you have all of these and you get a certification and speaking of which in the past 11 years i did about 20 to 30 certifications as well i think the and going back to what you're saying right where we're, we're constantly changing and moving. I think this is where I guess something that is very important for everyone, especially in our domain in IT should realize is that learning should be part of your day-to-day -day career. It should be, you know, my son 10 years old is like, oh dad, I don't want to go to school. I was like, you know, daddy is still going to school right now. You know, and uh, I, and I, uh, the, the idea that learning should be a continuous practice, right? Because something new will always come. Um, so that's why I guess to answer your question in summary, uh, business intelligence was something that I guess interested me a lot because of the data-driven decision-making process. And yeah, you learn a lot of cool things you can do with dashboards, dynamic uh, uh, information, and it came naturally. Sorry, it was a long answer to a very simple question, but no, no, uh, it was a very good one. In fact, I have a couple of things to branch out there. Um, sometimes, and I wonder how you feel about this. You know, there's this popular chart, I think, by Gartner, which mm -hmm. which coined the term descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive analytics, right? Mm -hmm. And although I I, I kind of know the point because as you move up that value chain. The difficulty gets uh worse, and but the value gets higher. But I feel also that descriptive analytics has been given such a bad light, like it feels so fundamental, and uh, I think it also there's this implication that you have to do one before the other. Mm. So in your case, was that? Did you feel that like before you get to predictive, yeah, you got to master <clears throat> dashboards first? That's a good question. Um, let me think about this. If I want to go to predictive and prescriptive, 
do I need to have a good solid understanding of at least the basic descriptive? Um, I think it will help uh, because, you know, from my uh, thoughts on this, uh, and I don't want to sound cliche, that's why I'm trying to think of an original thought here. Um, I think you could skip it if you intuitively understand the data, but if you don't understand the data, it will really help you right to to do some basic descriptive work so like you can also explore the data because uh you know if i give you 10 rows and 10 columns and you look at it and you must be a number genius you can probably already get that information in your head do the averages the means the standard deviations and just immediately start working with some models right okay, it doesn't make sense for 10 rows but my point is if you're if not then if going through those steps really helps right like if you can graph it bar chart, scattered chart, or uh, any kind of like a uh, heat map or anything to help get some basic information from it, you may discover something about it that you couldn't have intuitively, right? Unless you're the domain expert of that data, right? But I think uh, it's, it's wiser to go through those steps. And for me back then, I did not know how to do predictive and prescriptive. I just knew how to do descriptive um, and that's why, um, you know, it was just getting the data, presenting it in such such a way and form that could help the company make some basic decisions in the short term, right? Uh, it wouldn't help with long-term predictions, but just short term. Like uh, we did a lot with the uh, safety stock calculations because I used I worked for a logistics company after the military, so they needed vendor assessment, safety stock calculations, and. These KPIs are online, been there for decades. You just, you know, lead times and all these economic order quantities. People can do this with hands and Excel sheets, but make the difference is you put it in a dashboard where it auto updates on its own, right? So that's why dynamic update. So yeah, to answer your question, I think it's better to follow the process. It helps you as an individual in the long run. And uh, even today, I still find myself going to the basics of descriptive first before we start thinking about how to model and and provide some sort of predictions. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good, uh, and thanks for responding though. Because what I'm finding the, now, especially after everything in hindsight, I mean, all of this stuff started to become really popular approximately 10 years ago, 2012, 2014. So it's now 2024. So we can look back at yeah. the decade that was. No? I find that there's, Two, e nah, I wouldn't say equally, but two existing polar extremes. One extreme mm -hmm. is kind of this rigidity that you need to go through one stage before you go to the another stage. I think I like what you said better, that irrespective of the stages, you need to know how data works. So maybe there's that foundation and everything is just plugged on top. So rather than this escalating linear uh, you know, uh, progression, as long as you understand data, which is yeah, basically and, data management, then you can do whatever you want with it. You can be predictive yeah, with, uh, with it. And, and, and Doc, I just thought of something. Yeah. You know, it, it took me nine months of intensive training to master QuickView. It took me two and a half years of intensive training to master Python, machine, machine learning, and everything else. The point is that you know, and it took me years to master logistics. It took me years to manage military science and, you know, financial modeling and valuations and everything. And these are the fundamentals, right? Like it's it's great to have that because now you feel confident in yourself. But, you know, this is my thoughts now about generative AI, because I really, really believe at the hands of a smart person, generative AI is the great equalizer. Because... Going back to the idea of descriptive, predictive, and descriptive, and you know those terms, you don't have to go and code this in ClickView or Tableau or Microsoft Power BI or Tiboco or Python. You can actually just upload the data set to ChatGPT and say, hey, give me a descriptive analysis of this data. And within seconds, you can do what it would have taken minutes, if not hours, for someone who's trying to go through it, right? So maybe going back to that question you were asking earlier, I think, with the power of generative AI, like ChatGPT, uh, especially ChatGPT4, you could, in theory, skip descriptive and go straight to predictive. 
technically speaking, because it will do it for you. It will tell you, hey, this is what the data looks. But uh, again, I'm sure some of your viewers and yourself has experienced uh, ChatGPT is not always correct, right? Uh, there's about this, I would say, 80% correct. And that 20%, that's where I guess the foundation comes in, right? Because uh, some of the, pre the data it shows doesn't make sense. But the point is, I think eventually it will improve and it'll be the great equalizer. I, I think you mentioned that in some of your podcasts as well, right? Like productivity improvements are huge for people who use that tool. So I, I firmly believe that as well. Firmly believe that. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, back to you. No, no, that's exactly the opposite extreme where one hand, mm. some people are rigid about, oh, there's a, you know how, how there's this meme where there's the guy, go, there's a guy going up a staircase and he skips three, <laughs> three rungs trying to go up. And so that's one perspective. The other perspective is, I think equally uh, cons disconcerting is there are people who literally exactly what you said, jump directly into predictive modeling. And they yeah. I even know people who skipped Excel altogether, just went to Python and not realizing half of the stuff they're coding in Python is doable. Look, let's, one one let's, let's, be, yeah. let's be realistic here. Uh, my parents met in the 1970s. Hmm. Okay, my father was sent by the, the Philippine Navy to back then the Imperial Navy of Iran to teach electrical engineering to, to my to you know uh, the students in the Imperial Navy of Iran. And my mom was my dad's student. That's how they met. Hmm. My dad, my mom was learning Morse code in the 60s and 70s. Okay. And you could argue that, hey, you need to understand the basics of Morse code so that you will then understand the fundamentals of communication, blah, 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 blah. But we're at the point in time that Morse code is just antique. Yeah. Um, you could, in theory, and there are many multiple examples of this in history, right? Um, I don't even know how true it is where, you know, someone asked Einstein, do you remember that number? And Einstein said, no, I just look at it in the phone book. My point is that if we could free up our brain to do other more complex things, because there are tools and technologies that does the basic fundamentals for us, why don't we use that as an opportunity to do something even more creative and better than the basics Excel sheets and the descriptives? So I, I, I see both sides, right? Yeah. But I, th I, I think if you, we look at it historically, it's always the ones that use technologies to then think of something new and better mm. are the ones that progress, right? Yeah, I mean the, the anyway, main, just the main no, I totally agree. The main theme of the industrial revolution, uh industrial revolutions, there's actually several, is how technology made, you know, society societal yeah. growth possible. If we didn't have the steam engine, colonial colon colonization wouldn't have happened as quickly as it did. If we didn't have, you know, electricity, uh, the the colonies wouldn't have rebelled. <laughs> yeah. You had the, you know, electricity, the printing press. If we didn't have the Cold War, we wouldn't have the internet. So I mean, sure. these are these are interesting parallels. Kaya nga, I feel that every time you have a technological revolution, there's always a political revolution. They go hand in hand. And you know what they all have in common? I think, uh, I think what they all have in common is economics. Mm. I think in the end, it's all about economics. If it's more economically efficient, faster, better to use a new tool, yeah, economics will always win. So if you think about it, if it's more economically efficient of your time, your resources, your energy to use a tool like generative AI to do descriptive analytics so that you can then work on something else versus having to work, spend hours preparing all those codes and all those lines for yourself from scratch. And then you come to uh, maybe a week later and do the assessment. I spent five minutes with this result. I spent one hour with this result. The results are the same. You know what? Next time, I'll just continue using option two. And if I guess that's with the principles of the economics, right? It, it made more economic sense to use cars versus horses. And you know it makes more economic sense for us to video chat than for you to fly here to Switzerland than for me to fly there. I think eventually there will be an economic optimized way of working with generative AI, which will then make it the most logical thing to do moving forward. Uh, the, the that's what I'm thinking, like, right? The economics already work for it by default because we're talking like 10x, you know, productivity. Hmm. That's um, true. Diba? Parang things that took an hour can happen in minutes. Things that took days can happen in hours.
You know, I mean, yes. these 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 are too hard to ignore. But I think the tradition is the big baggage. People are used to doing certain things, certain ways. Uh, like for me, one of the best analogies is is a, almost a sci-fi analogy, which is, uh, he, he, I I'm sure you remember the clip of those two Falcon Nine rockets coming down in sync after they brought huh. the Falcon Heavy the first time around it. And I actually got emotional about that. No, medyo cringy to admit, but because suddenly this is the first time a spacefaring humanity is actually possible. You know. Yeah. Uh, up until that point, we were throwing away rockets every time you launched it. And for me, the, the sure. takeaway was there is no way in hell a human can do that. Like pilot rockets back down to a perfect touch landing. You would be losing the rocket. So in my in in my in my you know simplified understanding, we need artificial intelligence to drive these rockets to enable us mm -hmm. to become spacefaring. And you talk about uh, economics. At some point in time, we're going to be mining the moon. We're going to be mining asteroids. You know, a single asteroid probably has more GDP than the entire GDP <laughs> of of our current planet. You know, just bring yeah. bring an asteroid of diamonds back here and see what happens. You know, parang so I feel that uh, that's the hyper economy type. Mm -hmm. uh, no, type one civilization or type zero civilization. Uh, we're we're maximizing the planet and nearby heavenly bodies. These things are impossible without AI, are impossible without technology. So sure. if you bring that, that's medio sci-fi, that, that's probably fifth industrial revolution, bring it back to today, it's the same It's the same quantum leap. Uh, like I liken generative AI to, I don't know if you remember WordStar. Do you remember WordStar? WordStar was one of the first word processors. Uh, no, frankly, no. Okay. It, it, my, shape, my age is showing, but I remember attending a WordStar <laughs> workshop. I was a kid. In my mom's office, she was working for the government back then. And the government had this upscaling WordStar in the office initiative. And I remember distinctly that day where this guy was doing WordStar uh, 101. No one was attending. So I attended it. And I figured it out. I was a little kid. Okay, that's a word processor. Why? Everyone else was busy with their electric typewriters. <laughs> where mm. you could uh, edit one line at a time before you press enter and that was the major revolution no? and 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 then suddenly this guy said you don't have to do that you can edit the entire document in whole as a whole before you print it and people were like whoa <laughs> <laughs> and then fast forward later where the power app that i learned was excel i was in university and no one was studying excel i, I took up an accounting degree and everyone was busy with their adding machines and their columnar pads, you know, those big yellow pads with the grids in it where you put the numbers and their graphing calculators, those engineering calculators where you can draw, you know, parabolas and sine waves. And I said, Excel can do that. So I studied yeah. Excel on my own, on my own uh, you know, uh, via the F1 key. What, what's this function? What's that function? And my first, I would say my first 10 years in banking, was probably due to that fact that I knew how to use a spreadsheet. It wasn't due to the You're fact an that Excel I knew Jedi. Yeah, so that was it, and that was the beginning for me. That was the gateway drug to databases, and databases was the gateway drug mm. to coding, and and the rest is history, no? So that's it. I think we're we're on the cusp of something like that, where the early adopters will get rewarded. Because uh, did you see the Copilot ad? Microsoft Copilot. Yeah, for the Super Bowl. Yeah, that was amazing. That was, that was <clears throat> for me. That that spe that spoke to me. Eh? Parang yan. That's that's the philosophy. Of course, we can all argue about you know the evils, deep fakes, cheating, blah blah blah. But we, we we can't ignore the fact that we now have a gate a gateway to massive productivity, creativity, knowledge management at a level similar to those rockets landing, you know, in sync. Ganun siya. And imagine, no, the the fortune favors the bold, you know, in these in these mm. times, uh, to to do that. Anyway, I think we've digressed a lot, but no, no, it's a good uh, information and yeah, uh, it's a good story uh, you shared. Yeah, so back to BI. Okay, we went to the BI. How did you navigate the? You said you 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 had to upskill on your own for about a couple of weeks. How how did you do that? Is that still possible today? Are there any tips that you would give? The aspiring shifters into business intelligence. Yeah, definitely. 
it's it's doable it's easy um i would say back then it was youtube now there's a lot of uh courses online that are available for free uh coursera udemy as we mentioned earlier i think the advantage of going with coursera udemy i mean if people have a few i would say centavos or pesos to spare or a few dollars Just invest free. in udemy and coursera mm -hmm. and here's why you get a certificate Mm. Because, you know, I did not get a certificate for watching a YouTube video. I did not get a certificate for, you know, learning that tool and doing it. Whereas now you have, you need to, you need to have something to show as a badge of recognition for your effort and your work. That's why I would think investing that few, you know, pesos on or dollars or Swiss francs on that course certificate will go a long way. Um, I think uh, it's something that it should be considered more uh, by folks, right? And look, it's not tough to do uh, uh, these courses online. It takes uh, just an hour a week or sometimes two hours a week. And you, within a six to eight weeks, you'll be done. You'll learn a tool. And the difference is now don't take it to the extreme, right? Where you, you skim and skip through the course as fast as possible just, just to, to get, get the certificate. certificate. Yeah, that's now the other extreme. Then then you're not helping yourself because your right. bluff will be called out eventually when you do get that role or that job and they're like, hey, but you have a certificate and then they see you can't do it. So really genuinely going through that course, learning it, interacting in that course, having discussions, if you can, with your peers or professors, you know, I don't know if they always reply, right? You know, but, I, this speaks to me a lot because um, in, a, in, a, in another conversation I had, we talked about there's also this noticeable shift from qualification based to competency based education mm -hmm. and and the certificate is kind of the middle ground where in a way it's it's sort of a badge but it's a badge of competency because just because you took a phd or a master's degree or whatever doesn't necessarily mean you are competent you are qualified by by some institution and in some cases that's kind of a kind of a bottleneck for, for a lot of people. But then, as yeah. you pointed out, there is now this, I, I don't know if you, you, you we talked about this before, there's this interest, interesting glut of people who took these certificates but now struggle to get a job because they tend to skew to the kind of the technical side of things. So they learn the tools, they learn Python, they learn SQL, they learn Excel. But then I saw a post eh, on one of these forums and the post was, how did you guys navigate your capstone? <laughs> I can't figure out what to do with my capstone. So there's this interesting gap in the market where people know how to execute, but then they struggle with the mindset of an analyst, yeah. you know, which is a bit bit closer to research rather than dev. No? Um, did you encounter that uh, kind of that gap before for yourself or did you always have it because of your training? How, how did you reconcile that kind of mindset? Okay, so look... Uh... <laughs> It reminds me of my 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 philosophy is where there's a need, there's a way, there's a will, there's a way. Mm -hmm. I, I have this funny story in the the Philippine army. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, if I can share about it. Um, you know, the idea was when I first reported to my platoon in Mindanao. Mm -hmm. um, it was the time when I'm learning Filipino, and I don't speak Filipino very ah, because well. Because you were not then. a native speaker. Oh, I know. Yeah. Mas marunong ako ngayon. Uh, mas, mas magaling ang Tagalog ko ngayon. Pero noon, hindi ako marunong Tagalog. Uh, what happened was that my 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 first platoon, they only spoke Visayan. Oh no. <laughs> Double whammy. And, <laughs> and I only speak English. And I will never forget when I reported to my platoon and I spoke to them, I said, hey, I'm your platoon leader, Lieutenant Feliciano. Uh, and, you know, they said, thank you, sir. And then the next day, a guy comes to me and he said, Sir, paalam, gawash ako. And I was like thinking, why is he asking me if he wants to go wash? I was like, okay, fine. If you want to go wash, go wash. Salamat, sir. He goes, the next day, three people come. Sir, paalam, gawash kami. I said, yeah, sure. If you guys want to go wash, you go wash. You don't need to ask me. <laughs> and this would happen for a good two, uh, one, two, 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 two months. They would always come, sir, gawash ko. And I would always say, yes, go ahead, go ahead. Then on the second month, I formed them up. I said, look, gentlemen, uh, you what all come of, to me to ask what go kind wash. of washing if are you, you doing <laughs> yeah if you want to know i said if you want to go wash don't ask me just go they were all like yay you know they're all so happy 
And, you know, but they would still come to me and paalam gawash gawash. So then I, I remember I asked uh, back then, Lieutenant, uh, First Lieutenant Clavel, hey, sir, why do the troops keep asking me to go wash? I just say, you're the platoon leader. I say, yes, but why do I care if they want to do their laundries? <laughs> Bisaya and then for he started laughing. To leave, right? Gawas. Yes. <laughs> and that's where he was like, look, gawash means actually labas. It's mm. like, oh, wow. I didn't know that. And then he, I'll never forget his re reaction. He's like, oh, kaya pala. Anyway, the point is, I formed them up and I said, look, starting today, bawa lang Bisayan, bawa lang English, taglish tayo. <laughs> and ako, ako yung Tagalog ko because mm. there was a necessity to communicate. Kasi we we needed to communicate. So the reason I say that story is because going back to your question mm -hmm. about how did I experience it, I did not know anything about logistics. I did not know anything about the data science or business intelligence, but there was a need for it. Yes. And when there is a need, you push yourself to make sure that gets to, done. To, so I had it, I had yeah. a need to learn business intelligence. So I learned it, right? And I got this course and I got it. I had a need to learn logistics and warehouse management systems. So I took the, the online training while doing my job on the side, learning this so that I could do the next big thing. Um, and this is where I think the courses that people should take should be something that not if they're not passionate about it, but at least something that would be a, the job that you need really needs that kind of skill, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you won't end up in a situation of you're upskilling for a skill that you will end up never using, losing, using. Now, in a situation where they don't get a job, join projects, right? And and this is this is the other thing. The only way you can practice the skills you're learning from a video or some side chats or IDE environments is to apply it in the real project. There's many Kegel projects out there that you can join. And there are even some, you know, that yours truly are, are trying to put together uh, to help people apply some of these skills. And uh, I don't know if that would be a nice segue to Project Earthquake. Uh, yeah, wait, but, we might uh, as well start talking about that. But be before we do that, I yeah, I want to double underscore the need to get into some practical work right now yeah. the options are yeah you meet me you can do you can do internships maybe you can do you can join hackathons like i, I i'm a big yeah. hackathon nut uh you can offer to do pro bono work i i just feel though that there might be a bridging opportunity to offer some sort of training that develops that thinking the closest i can think of mm. was when i i took my own online course back in the pandemic on epidemiology because we were uh, we were getting into a lot of projects that involve COVID response, COVID monitoring, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of jargon. So I felt I need to understand this world, and and I didn't regret it because epidemiology is basically you know the study of uh, epidemics, and it's actually a data science uh, type mm -hmm. uh, course where you look at the data of epidemics, you look at these you know epidemic curves, reproductive numbers, so. It, it it spoke to me as a data person, but at the same time, part of that training was uh, there was one framework that I learned in Epi called depth diagnostic, mm -hmm. uh, diagnostic etiological, uh, uh, prognostic and therapeutic, and it mirrors kind of like the analytical framework. Diagnostic is simply just look at differences between populations, you know. This population died and this population survived. Look at the common characteristics. Etiological is a bit more precise. You're trying to establish causa, causal relationships. So you have to remove confounding variables. It becomes more statistical. But the idea is, as opposed to diagnosing something, here is, okay, the presence of these factors will portend a likely fate of X, right? Mm -hmm. That's a big jump already. Then you have prognostics. Prognostics is pretty much tracking the progression of a disease. So uh, we would call it forecasting in analytics land, but that in a way it's forecasting, but for diseases. So not only are you potentially looking at factors, but you're looking at certain factors speed up a, a, a condition, certain factors slow it down, certain factors stop it. So there's a, a, time, a time element, a time series element to it. They call it longitudinal element. And then the, the, I think that the pinnacle is therapeutic. This is where mm. randomized controlled trials come in, where you're literally intervening in a in an epidemic and testing which interventions actually work. And 
we get that in marketing analytics as well. You do A B tests, you know, and I was thinking of A B testing as well. Yeah, yeah. So my my takeaway from that is, gosh, everything I know in analytics is actually what they're doing in epidemics. So back to your point about if you understand how data works, you can attack any problem. And mm -hmm. however, on the flip side, would I be able to walk into any hospital and and just ask for you know a job to manage epidemics without being a medical doctor? Probably not, right? But yeah. that was a unique opportunity because we were working with WHO, we were working with UNICEF, and they had no data people, at least not locally. They had very few uh, pool of experts to tap. So that's how we found a niche. But it was not necessarily reinventing the wheel. It's stuff we knew already, but it's called something else. And Yeah, it was called something else. Yeah, and that's, that's how I also kind of give advice sometimes to people who are asking for some coaching or mentorship. How do you think like an analyst? Is that you have to bring it, you have to sort of think like a scientist, like a researcher. Mm. You're looking at a phenomena. What drives that phenomena? Or if you're looking at, in most cases, the phenomena is profit or loss in a company. But it can be, you know, steps to that lead to profit and loss. Why did the customer buy? Why did the customer not buy? Why did the customer leave? Why did uh, your employee resign? You know, why did this, uh, uh, why mm -hmm. did the borrower not pay? So it's always that point of uh, kind of that phenomena. And then everything else is data that describes that phenomena. And if you find a way to establish patterns, that's that's basically the job. And then you do a report and you do a dashboard that maybe tracks it or simulates it. So that's when your execution skills come in. Okay, now I have an idea of the story that I want to show. And the story is basically that phenomena. Uh, then I execute it. Now for someone to go from zero to that level of thinking, I'm wondering what will it take other than you get to work with a doc or a Mario or someone who's already done it. It seems like that's the missing link. Because what, how, it, is, how it's translating, just to the, finish the thought, how it's translating yeah. to the workforce now is there's a glass ceiling of two years. Mm. So if you're less than two years of experience, you're not going to find a job. So that's kind of a proxy of if you've lasted in the job for two years, maybe you might know something. And that's what HR people are doing. And I find that rather unfair. But right now, what's the, what's the solution? You know, just sharing the concept. No, no, it's a good, it's a good way to see it. And I was thinking, um, isn't that the purpose of statistics classes? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, when I took my master's in data science, we had at least two of those courses. One was statistics, and the other one was research and uh, analysis. Right, going yeah. through the step-by-step -step research process of collecting data, and all that. So, I think that is the advantage that many uh, people should think about perhaps is that maybe the statistics classes that they've been taking was the basis of the data data uh, expertise that they needed right mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it's an interesting point you bring that I mean this is something I'm not aware especially in the the the, the area that you you really do need two years huh, before they give you a break yeah, so it's kind of a chicken That's egg. Interesting. You know, you need mm -hmm. you, you need to get a break to get the two years, but they won't give you the break if you don't have two years. So, so it might be really... nursing. They yeah, like, exactly. First before, exactly. right? So what and what happens in nursing? It's even worse. A high a highly in demand, uh, you know, profession is paid so low up until a point, which then encourages more and more nurses to leave, uh, and find uh, fortune elsewhere. And that worsens the healthcare, you know, problem back home. Do you think this is a challenge just for the Philippines or global? I think it could, I, I don't know enough, but it could be a phenomena that haunts, you know, job markets anywhere. It just, mm -hmm. it just, it's just probably particularly pronounced in the Philippines for certain occupations. And, and I'm wondering if the same thing is happening to data science now or data analytics now because of that glass ceiling. So what happens now is either people take remote work if they can find it or work in a BPO, which is probably a good idea, or try to look for work abroad um, unless you already happen to have the two years of experience and then it gets really sticky. Uh, mm -hmm. It feels weird. Eh? So I feel that maybe the bottleneck is really if, 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 if two years represents thinking like an analyst, is there another way we can bridge it? via some sort of a structure, you know, 
maybe I, i'm just yeah. thinking thinking out loud right i'm thinking maybe the universities where these individuals graduate or the you know the institutions where they get their certifications should probably pay or play a role yeah i'm thinking right probably, yeah. um because like example when i when i finished the i, I studied in three american schools and oh, well, it wasn't they, michigan all, all the whole time Ah, because of your no, no. West Point was the first, and you had another one. And the I, had, I went West Point, Rochester University, uh, and also Michigan. Yeah. Um. I guess the thing that I found common in all of them is that as soon as you graduate, you get contacted by headhunters, uh, job, yeah, j job placement headhunters who have partnered with the school. Yeah. Right. They have partnered with the school, and I and I know it's not something that may be feasible for. Let's say the, the the Philippines, right? Because not all the universities have the resources to do that. But I think you know, if the universities or the colleges take the initiative to at least reach out to some of these industries and tell them that, hey, you know, and, and I don't know, some basic memorandum of agreement, it might be able to do two things, right? One, encourage more talent to join their institution. Two, uh, give these SMEs, startups, medium-sized companies, or whatever in the Philippines, especially in the far-flung areas of Mindanao, you know, Visayas, they need these kinds of folks, right? The opportunity to also get these people with this new knowledge and this new industry trend to come and help them in agriculture or forestry or yeah, well, you name it, right? Uh, I think that is one way, uh, perhaps, to help bridge that lack of two years experience right um you know what singapore anyways. does um they have this thing called skills future you might have heard of it and i only learned recently because it was at, at first skills future sounds like your usual run of the mill you can call it that upskilling initiative sponsored by the government we that we did something similar with project sparta which was inspired by skills sparta, future. Yeah. now the but it stopped right yeah, officially ended. It's on extended life, but it should have been institutionalized, if you ask me, as a program. Exactly. I think so, too. Now, in Skills Future, I only learned recently that they get over this. They also have this glass ceiling phenomena in Singapore, but not as uh, pronounced as here. And what happens is the government actually steps in and employs the graduates for six mm. months minimum to a year. And in a way, they, they kind of cover it. So it's part of their, mm. it's part of the funding. Like, okay, we're going to give you a job in the government. You do data analysis, you do predictive analytics. So that once you've gone through that sausage machine, you actually not have, not just, uh, not, not just have skills via your credentials, but you actually have actual work experience where you may or may not have picked up a lot of these problem solving uh, and critical thinking and design thinking, you know, and project management skills. Uh, because you can't really kind of take a MOOC and learn that no you, you got to do it and that's how they bridge it and then companies are then happy to pick it up at that point now okay we're happy if you're already a skills future yeah. product there's a job waiting for you but that sounds like a very expensive Singapore can that's do it you know it's uh yeah they, they have the money and they're not that big in terms of population but is that something Philippines can do will do I don't know uh so I, now I'm wondering thought bubble uh, uh you know open Maybe it does still need to happen, but it's not government that steps in. It's some, I don't know, NGO or association. You know, organizations like uh, like IBPAP, for example, can maybe step in. Mm. AAP, and because that's what they're for. Eh? They're like the uh, kind of the the external party pass. So you have private, public, academia, and then there's them. How do they kind of interact with all of these, you know, uh, institutions to to quicken the adoption? Yeah. You know, you know, I was thinking also as we're talking, you know, what they did was they sent nurses to far flung areas that needed them the most. Mm -hmm. Right. And it was not as it was not, you know, attractive pay wise and everything. Right. But experience. imagine a similar. Yes. Experience wise, it was something that it really helped them. But I'm just thinking if something similar could be done. Right. Instead of sending nurses to far flung areas of the Philippines or rural towns and and situs and barangays, what if you send these graduates or these technical certificate knowledge people, right? With uh, who? What if you send them these data analysts, these these the data you know scientists 
to these areas. And come on, Philippines is huge. Yeah. It's almost half the size of Europe. I'm sure there's someone out there who needs the help. They just don't know what data science is. They don't know what AI is and all that. And I guess that bridge, I guess, is the tough one, building that but, bridge. But who pays right? the that bill? So is that government paying the bill? In a way, you become a government employee for a mandatory number of years. I think if we if you make the right project proposal and the business case, it could be funded mm. by the government. I, really I remember so, really. uh, President Marcos recently said they're considering that kind of an option where uh, not necessarily employing the people, but if you're the government will sponsor your upskilling, but you're required to serve a minimum number of years in the Philippines. So it doesn't become a natural brain drain before you know you consider going abroad. But uh, honestly, it's I don't even think you should you, you need to do that. If the jobs are there, people will take them. The problem is jobs mm. aren't there because they, they have this glass ceiling thing. And on the government, there aren't enough of those jobs at all. You know, government and data analyst jobs. I don't think I don't think they're picking them off. You know, uh so there so and the challenge now is we might end up having a kind of a broken uh, buyer's remorse situation where all of these people, many of them career shifters actually, are shifting to analytics, studying all these skills, and then not able to translate them to any active employment or business opportunity, kind of end up regretting it yeah. and not doing it. No? Um, I mean, it's not as fungible as, let's say, web development. I mean, web development is pretty mm. universal. Problema with web development it be it became so fungible that the tools also got better. So you have the WordPresses and the square spaces of the world automating what would otherwise be a web development career, no? So that's an interesting phenomenon. So baka the same thing might happen later because we're not able to place the data analyst population with the jobs. The tools will end up taking their place. You know, chat GPT comes in and becomes the data analyst. In which case, the people who study data analysis need to also start retooling again to generative AI, and then finally they get a job. I don't know. That could that might be. I mean, market forces act that way. Eh? But on nature abhors yeah. any vacuum. Look, this is a very very interesting problem, mm. and it it really one makes me want to like invest time, energy, brain power, and what just figuring it out. No? <laughs> try to figure it out. You know, because look, I worked in the government. Mm -hmm. um, it has its downsides and upsides, but a right project proposal with the right networks can can do things, right? Can go far, okay. It can really go far, right? You and I think the example was the project Spartan, right? And uh, unfortunately, it, it it was not institutionalized, right? But yeah, but yeah. it is possible. And look, I I I, I refuse to believe that. Uh, we don't have funding in the government. We oh, have. We have money. Money's right. Flowing. We have. We just need the right proposal, the right business case, uh, and it can happen, right? Mm. So I guess if people want to spend time and energy thinking of a problem or a, uh, think of how to write project proposals and uh, go to a golf game or a coffee shop, meet that you know, as a know, matter of congressman. <laughs> Or senator or talking to help about sponsor. talking about proposals and and we should segue quickly to your project right after this by the way but okay um so we work a lot with DOST uh you know in the Sparta thing and we continue to to kind of keep in touch and they and they said there's two problems happening right now number one the queue for new proposals is backed up almost two years so you submit something now your funding window is 2026. That's one problem. The other okay. problem is they're still, despite that uh, long queue, under quota in terms of disbursing funds. So there's an inherent inefficiency already, but they're not spending enough. And the other problem on that front is the general lack of quality proposals. People don't know how to write a proposal uh, of what is otherwise a decent project. I've been on those tech. I've been invited to be a technical panel, on to judge some of these proposals, and yeah, I, I would agree. Some of them are in horrible shape. They're not clearly articulated. Uh, they don't. You don't know what they're trying to achieve. There's not. There's not enough. Uh, uh like these are the common, uh, attributes. You don't know what they're trying to achieve. 
they only talk about technology. They don't talk about risks. They don't talk about outcomes. And mm. they'll throw words like AI and machine learning around, but not elaborate exactly what you mean by AI and machine learning. But you kind of know when you meet the proponent that they know what they're trying to do. So there's this gap of, but you're not able to put it into a decent document that you know a funder will see, I want to fund this cost and benefit analysis, et cetera, which is for me tragic. It seems like it's such a, such a low hanging fruit that's not addressed. So my immediate instinct after running through several of these gauntlets, I, I used to do that a lot, especially in 2021, 2022, is why don't we just start teaching people how to write proposals, assuming that hmm. that's the gap, you know, a proposal writing one-on-one webinar, you know, something like that. That's what I mean about maybe there is a life hack. And in the same manner, the the whole data analyst glut population Maybe there is a webinar we can do about, okay, how do you think like an analyst? How should you think uh, before you even bring technology on the table? It's the art of asking the right questions. It's the right of, uh, it's the art of formulating the proper problem statement, something along those lines, right? Yeah. No, Anyways, I mean, look, uh, yeah, go ahead. this is, uh, I think, a perfect segue because I like one page project proposals. Hmm. And this was basically what we did for a volunteer project. We call it Project Earthquake, if it's all right to maybe. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about, about that now. I was going to ask, say, let's, let's segue into it. Uh, so tell us about okay, Project so, Earthquake. Um, I'm, I'm going to share my screen, and I don't know if it's going to work. Yeah, go ahead. Hopefully it does. I can see it. So you, you see it. Okay, so basically in, in May of uh, 2023, uh, we sent out to basically... The idea was I, I, I there's this group right in Facebook where we it's called I think the data science data science group, right? yeah yeah so in May of 2023 I just sent a very simple question I asked hey is there anyone interested to work on a seven to nine man team to help uh, you know use data science to help predict earthquakes in this post I had almost a hundred and one people who reacted. So it became something interesting that we started formalizing it. And then by June, we already had a team, right? Uh, we came up with at least 31 people who signed up who want to be part of it. We created a simple project proposal. It, again, it's very basic to the point that the idea here was that, you know, the background was we're in the Pacific Rim, uh, highly seismic region. Our motivation was, can we have a group of volunteers, patriotic people to come together, work, use their, our knowledge and expertise in artificial intelligence, machine learning to, you know, do some sort of prediction. And this is, you know, just on a, as a segue, I personally like a one page project proposal, like something like this, because in this one page, you answer the who, the where, the what, the when, the why in of what go. we're trying to do in one go, right? And then if you need details, that's the time you can add it down in later on in the details, right? Uh, if, if you want to get more information. But this was our first draft of a project proposal, right? Like we are trying to see if we can harness the power of artificial intelligence. Uh, why is this important? You know, we want to help build community resilience. And then what is the scope? So you see, it's like already the what, why, where, what are the key questions? And then what is the proposal? So, you know, we're going to propose a core team. We're going to try to define the processes, the technology. And then again, you know, why do, what's the benefits? This is where the business case or the, why is this important? And what's the doing nothing, you know, continue with current system, product technologies, policy. So yeah, this was just a draft idea, right? And then this is what we built on as a team. Um, I'm happy to say that, I've been we've been working together with the with the team for about three quarters now. Again, a group of volunteers, right? So we went from the planning phase, execution, and now we're in the data modeling phase at Sprint Fifteen. Uh, it's been a fun project because we're we're bringing in students, and I'll show you the composition of the team. But the idea here was that we went to the step by step processes of a simple project, right? Where we're trying to implement an agile, a hybrid agile waterfall methodology. We have a planning phase, the execution phase, and as you can see, data collection and data cleanup was a very, very 
uh, work intensive uh, time for us. Um, you know, and that's maybe one thing I wanted to share with the team and the folks on the call is that with any data science project, it's not just going in and doing data modeling right away. The data collection and scrapping and cleanup takes a lot of time, especially if you're working with a team of volunteers. And um, and basically, we were. This is basically the team we were able to bring together. Um, and the reason why I'm showing this is because, like any team of volunteers, uh, you know, we agreed to commit about an hour of our time. I would say that from this original team where we had the core team here who are the people who would like to apply their expertise and knowledge. We had students and observers who are part of the team. Uh, we are also bringing in subject matter experts and we tried to also partner with key stakeholders. Now, what happened one year later? One year later, out of the observers, probably only two are still there. Out of the core team, only four are still active, okay? And we were never able to bridge our project with the key stakeholders. Despite this, we were able to achieve a significant uh, milestone because together with the team, we had Rick, Cholo, and a few others, we were able to collect data from open source information. Uh, we, were get, we were able to get data from Raspberry Shake. Who would have thought that Raspberry Shake could be something we could use? We got data from USGS. Uh, we sent request letters to FIVOX and DOST to also give us access to data. And, you know, that's going through that bureaucratic process of getting approvals, requests, and why we're doing this. But the reason why I'm sharing this uh, with you, Doc, and your audience is that you don't need money to run a project, okay? You don't need a budget. It's great to have a budget. It's great to have the funding. It's great to have the support but it doesn't stop you from trying to do something if you believe in what that vision and the output is of what you're trying to do. For us, we believe we're helping the Filipino people by, by working with our knowledge and expertise to help them be resilient, to save lives, to save resources. And despite lack of support and funding from any formal organization or government, we, the six core people who are still working on this, once every two weeks we're meeting and we're working one hour a week, we're still persevering and moving forward because we believe in our motivation, right? We really believe that this will help the Filipino. So I guess the, the this is also maybe an invitation to others who would like to be part of Project Earthquake, who would like to, you know, if you've been who you have been or know someone who's been impacted by earthquakes in the Philippines, if you are interested in data science, would like to spend, and they have only 60 minutes, one hour a week to spare, reach out, join our group, help us, you know, save lives by, you know, working with us in Project Earthquake. I, I just wanted to share that. Again, um, it's a very simple proposal that we made, and I made the project proposal with additional details at the bottom, ways of working, methodologies, and all that in here. So that if anyone asks, we have this. We can share this proposal. And maybe, of course, we can, we maybe we our... can share a, a link in the description later yeah. on where how people can sign up. And I'm sure yeah, a lot of people would be, be interested. Uh, and but... we have our team repositories, everything, our meeting minutes, our everything is recorded. So it's a very structured project. Uh, that you know, I'm 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 also working and managing the structure together with a few people. And you know, the amazing thing is, this 31 people are from are Filipinos from all over the world. That's the cool part. Um, but yeah, we're only down to six now, and we're still open to getting more folks who, who if they would like to join. Do you have any so, yeah, uh, specific need, like for a skill set? That that data modeling. Like so it's data. So is you, it data modeling. You, this is the, the the database side, or is this the statistical model side? The statistical, the supervised, unsupervised, the neural networks modeling. You know, if they have experience with PyCaret or Python modeling with PyTorch or okay. TensorFlows, we are we did all the hard work for fifteen sprints to get that data. We have five gigs of data, five gigs from almost thirty one Raspberry sensor shake networks. Uh, we yeah. have data from USGS for the past 50 years. 
we've merged them, we've created already machine learning. Uh, this is number three, but we've already created machine learning number four as our model. We need people to help us work in groups of one or two to start using different uh, models to see what kind of predictive analytics you or can prescriptive get. analytics mm -hmm. we can get, yes. Yeah, yeah I remember, um, um, maybe I'll send that to you after a call. We had someone do kind of a, a high level earthquake analysis for for the Bangsamoro region. Um, okay. We because we held the, the a Bangsamoro data challenge. I'm sure he he must have been using a similar data set. So I'll slip that to you. Maybe you can reach out to that guy. Uh, he's okay. Actually, Thank you. He's actually an AI engineer, rather a rather good one. Okay. Um, I just realized we're we're at the hour. <laughs> it's yeah. it goes by very fast. Um. We, we have to save some for the next episode, as I always say. Uh, any parting thoughts that you'd like to leave the audience? And Well, first, I, I want to thank you, Mario, for, number one, sharing your story. It's an amazing journey from military now to, to earthquakes uh, and blockchain. And also sharing your perspectives on career shifting, on data science, on business intelligence. Yeah, but again, uh, before we go, maybe you'd like to share a few things to our audience and then we can you know wrap up and catch up next time um well i i guess maybe in parting in the last one minute i just wanted to share that my desire to help the philippines is still there uh, even though i'm not doing it directly as a military officer or through politics i'm i'm trying to find other ways to do it that's why i put up project earthquake because i believe it's one way to help i've also set up a, a startup called Swiss Pine Tech, where I'm trying to help bridge Filipino talent with folks and customers here in Europe. Because I believe and I am very adamant and believe in the Filipino talent. And if I can help the Filipino talent by providing them with jobs and opportunities to still work from the Philippines, but help pro showcase our skill and talent to folks here in Europe, then so be it. This is my way of helping. So that's why I did Again, Project Earthquake and my founding company that I started this year, Swiss Pine Tech, and uh, would be happy if people would like to join me in that journey. And maybe with your help, Doc, I can put those links also in the chat, uh, in the video description so that, you know, people can also uh, be part of this journey uh, that, you know, you don't have to be in the Philippines to help the Philippines. You can even help the Philippines, even if you're outside. Yeah, because I think there's some with the millions of Pinoys we have outside the Philippines, there are ways for them to help. And for those technical experts uh, in IT, uh, join me in helping the Philippines through these two initiatives. OK, well said. So, yeah. So thanks, Mario, and hope to catch you again in another conversation. Thank you, Doc.